forever, forever worship you. I can only imagine. Oh, yes. A singer, mother, glory and power, feel to Good morning. Everyone in here gets a special reward in heaven for making it to church on Daylight Savings Day. A few announcements. So, eggs. Uh, Tori Sandage has started a collection of candy for an Easter egg hunt. We're going to have an Easter egg hunt in between ser uh, services on Easter. So basically, we've got bags of plastic Easter eggs, and your job is to pick up a bag, take it home, fill it with your favorite candy, and then bring it back here, and that's what we'll use for the egg hunt. So I believe there's a don Tori, uh, I believe there's a do donation box. I can't remember where exactly it is, but Fellowship Hall. Thank you. Um, so yeah, so we've got till Palm Sunday. Is that right? Palm Sunday to do that. So cheap, easy way to help out. Also, Maundy Thursday supper is coming up, if you will sign up for that. I realized until this morning that we didn't make that link super easy to find, so five minutes ago, I put it on the church Facebook page, so go on Facebook, sign up through there. If you don't have a Facebook, I know you know someone who does, so the link should be available through our Facebook page. Hmm? Or call the office, yeah, talk to Mary Ann or Pastor. Let's see, directories are in. I know we've been waiting for that for a long time. So Laverne is going to be in the fellowship hall after each service. So you can go up and go and pick up one from her. And I believe if you did not get your picture taken, it will be a charge of $15. But if you have gotten your picture taken, those you've already paid for it. And those are free for you. And then Matt Barone is starting a, a men's small group that's going to start next month on April 3rd. So if you're a, a dude and you've been looking for a small group to get plugged into, that will be great. I believe that the first few minutes of each small group, you're going to have a chance to minister to our kids and youth since they meet on Wednesday nights as well. And then it'll fo be followed up by a Bible study. So if you'd like to be another great male influence in a child's life and get some Bible study in. That's going to start April 3rd, and those will be at 6 p.m. And last but not least, I'm starting a Sunday school class that starts today. So we're going to meet in the basement in the classroom area. It's actually the old children's director's office. Tori and Marianne have transformed that into a classroom for us. It's basically going to be a book, book club style Bible study. It's geared towards ages 25 to 50, but absolutely everybody is welcome. And I've got Shipley's donuts and meat kolaches. So you should definitely come by. And that should be it. Good to see you all this morning. All right, then. So... I didn't bring kolaches or donuts, but it's still time to stand and worship. So if you're able to do that, uh, join in with us.
Please remain standing for our time of prayer. I really got into that last verse. It is well with our soul. <laughs> Will you bow your heads with me? Father God, we know that part of trusting you requires submitting ourselves before you in surrender. Lord, we know that as much as we have ideas of how something ought to go, ultimately you know the correct path. Father, teach our hearts to do your will and allow us to entrust our hearts with you and you alone. Lord, help us surrender to you willingly so that we may experience the abundance of your plans and goodness. Even if it does not look like it is in this very moment, remind in our hearts that you are good and your will is correct for our lives and ultimately the plan for the kingdom of heaven. In Jesus' name, we all said, amen. Holy Father, we ask that you pour out your blessings on us gathered here and on these gifts and tithes, for they are yours. They are yours to do with, and God, we ask that you help us to follow your ways and your will, that these gifts and tithes may be used for your purposes, to build your kingdom so that others may know the power of your saving grace so that others may know the love that you have for us that extends beyond all time that was there in the beginning and will be with us forever. God bless us today. Help us give 
boldly so that your love may shine through the darkness of this world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, children, come on down for the children's lesson. Good morning, friends. How are y'all today? Good. I'm so glad to see y'all. Hi, good morning. You want to sit right here? Hi, friends. Thank y'all for coming to church today. So I'm going to ask you for something that I don't think I have ever, ever asked for before. Are y'all ready? I want you to complain. Can you tell me some of your complaints? What, Isaiah? I don't like complaints. You don't like what? You don't like, oh, you don't like, like, you don't like the blow pops. Okay, well, thanks. <laughs> Noted. You don't get one. <laughs> yes, ma'am. You, like you don't like that you have to wear a dress to church. Okay. 
And, and you don't like the cameras? Okay. Who else? What's up, Jake Ryan? Why don't, what? Complain about something. What's broken? Your Crocs are broken? Yeah. Yes, Jameson? The music is too loud. Okay. Anybody else? Church family, any complaints this morning? We'll just open it up. Yes, sir, Jackson. You like gum? Oh, I can always count on you to like gum. That's so good. Anybody have any complaints? Any other complaints? What about waking up extra early this morning? Was that a complaint? I know you have complaints. Yeah, yeah. So our Bible story today is about um, the Israelites. Y'all remember who they were? Remember Moses led them out of slavery and out of Egypt? Remember that, that God parted the, the Red Sea? Okay, so these Israelites, God had just saved them from slavery. He's taking them to this new land, and they complained nonstop. Not like us, not just a few statements like what we did today. Nonstop. God was feeding them manna from heaven. They were fussing about the food. They didn't like the wilderness that they were in. They complained about everything. They even cursed God and cursed Moses. They told um, them that he should have just left him in Egypt to die there. And you know what God did? God was like, fine, fine. If y'all want to die in Egypt, let me just send these snakes. And so he sent these snakes. And they were biting people, and the Israelites were dying. And then the Israelites were like, okay, yeah, we sinned. We shouldn't have cursed God. We shouldn't have cursed you. Moses, will you just please pray so that God will save us from these snakes? And so Moses prayed. And you know what God did? Did God stay mad and let them all die from snake bites? No, because you know what? That's not who God is, is it? He told Moses to make a snake, put a snake on a pole. So Moses made this bronze snake, and anybody who saw the bronze snake that was bitten by a snake, they wouldn't die. And can you think of another time whenever there were things, there were sins that were, that got in the way of um, the people's relationship with God? What, What did God do later to make sure that we didn't die. Can y'all remember maybe his son that he sent to die for our sins? That's the God that we serve, right? He is always going to make a way for us, even though we complain, even though we're wrong, even though we do things that we shouldn't do, right? We say things that we shouldn't say. God's always going to make a way for us, right? Yeah, he's always going to make a way. Let's say a prayer, okay? God, we thank you so much that you love us and that even whenever we fall short and we complain and we fail to see the blessings that you pour out upon us, you are always making a way for us and you are always saving us. Please help us to look to you and to always share your love with others. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning. morning. Let us stand for God's word, please. And I loved how Dawn paraphrased the scripture. That was beautiful. Thank you, Dawn. Numbers 21, 4 through 9. They traveled from Mount Hor along the route to the Red Sea to go around Edom. But the people grew impatient on the way. They spoke against God and against Moses and said, Why have you brought us out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? There's no bread. There's no water. And we detest this miserable food. Then the Lord sent venomous snakes among them. 
They bit the people, and many Israelites died. The people came to Moses and said, We have sinned when we spoke against the Lord and against you. Pray that the Lord will take the snakes away from us. So Moses prayed for the people. The Lord said to Moses, Make a snake and put it on a pole. Anyone who is bitten can look at it and live. So Moses made a bronze snake and put it on a pole. Then when anyone was bitten by a snake and looked at the bronze snake, they lived. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Thank you, Pat. Well, good morning, everyone. Well, I don't have much to complain about today because I'm an early riser and getting up early is uh, one of my favorite things in the whole world. And just like every early riser, uh, we, lo- we wish that everybody would be happy in the morning. So we like getting everybody up in the morning, right? Um, I did have some stuff to complain about yesterday, though. Uh, uh, I'm still not a good golfer. And... <laughs> And it, that is one of those, uh, th- those, those games where you can be bad 98% of the time, and you get one good shot, and you love it all over again, right? But um, so uh, today is the, the fourth Sunday of Lent. We're, we're, we're over halfway through, and uh, uh, so your fast is halfway over if you're fasting. And, uh, uh, but in two weeks, we, uh, we will be celebrating Palm Sunday and that'll be the beginning of Holy Week. And if you haven't uh, signed up for uh, some, uh, the things that we have or heard about what we're doing in Holy Week, we have some really great opportunities. Uh, we're having a, um, a pasta supper on Monday Thursday. It, it's a mix of, it's like a dinner worship. And if you didn't get to experience it last year, I really encourage you to sign up on that. And um, uh, the main reason why we want to sign up, it is free. We are taking a love offering to help pay for the meal, but... Uh, but it is free, but we want to know how many people to buy food for. We don't want to overbuy, and we don't want to underbuy. So if you would sign up for that, we would appreciate that. But uh, and then we have a soup supper on Friday and uh, uh, a worship service that evening, which is uh, going to be very powerful and inspiring. Uh, please come for that. Uh, and then we have Easter. And, uh, and, and we get to celebrate the birth of our, or the, the crucifixion and resurrection of our Lord. This is a, a wonderful season to remember uh, who we are. And uh, just like I was grumbling uh, out uh, on the golf course yesterday, uh, we, we grumble a lot, don't we? I think sometimes we look at the people of Israel uh, in the Old Testament and we think, man, they're just a bunch of complainers. But we do that too, don't we? Like my wife complaining when I wake her up early. She's not the early riser. I am. <laughs> but um, over the past few weeks, we've been considering the season of Lent and, and what it's meant to represent. And, and two weeks ago, we, we considered what Jesus described in Mark's gospel as losing our life for the sake of him. Do you remember that? And then, and then last week, we, we talked about the Ten Commandments and how that was a measure of God's goodness and the recipe for us obtaining salvation on our own, which we've been able to discern that uh, we're not very good at, right? Well, this week we're going to discuss another story in Torah, or uh, the, uh, the first five books of the Bible. And this is from the book of Numbers. And um, though it is the fourth book, it is still part of that Exodus story of Moses bringing the people to the promised land. And uh, four of those books are really focused on that story. Well, this, uh, well, at this part of the story, they were less traveling to the promised land as more and more wandering in the wilderness, right? But they were nearing the end of their journey. Well, regardless of all that, uh, we're going to uh, see how this story connects to the Lenten season. And to do that, uh, I think that we need to prepare ourselves. Uh, so will you pray with me? Holy Father, we come here today to to your throne, to hear your words. God, open our hearts to hear you. Open our minds. Let your story ring out 
in these stories of old and how it is still part of us today. God, your scriptures tell a story of love and in the midst of our grumbling, you continue to love us. And God, we just ask that we hear your voice today, that you draw us near. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So a few years have passed since last week uh, in the story of the, of the Ten Commandments and uh, Mount Sinai. In fact, 39 years have now passed since that time. And, and a lot has happened. And the book we find this story in is, the, like I said earlier, the fourth book of the Torah, uh, which is the first five books of the Bible. And Torah really means the law or the way. More, more accurately, it's the way. And um, this uh, book includes the journey of Moses, uh, or these four books in, uh, include the journey of Moses from birth to death right on the doorstep of the, the promised land. And, and I want to take a minute and explain how these books work, to, how they work and how they're organized. Genesis includes everything from the, day, uh, the dawn of creation to a man named Jacob who God would uh, rename Israel and which is where we get the name the people of Israel because it starts with his family, the sons of Israel who would become the, the 12 tribes of Israel. And in Exodus in chapter 1, we, we, we fast forward really quick from, from Jacob's story to the birth of Moses and the rest of the book actually contains the first year of the, uh, of the Exodus, from the time that they left Egypt to the first year in the wilderness, which includes a, a, a several month stop at a place called Mount Sinai. And, uh, and it also includes the building of the tabernacle, which will be used as the temple of God until uh, they enter the promised land and, and uh, King Solomon eventually erects the, the temple. Now Leviticus is a book that is... Uh, uh, is, is a little bit difficult to get through. Who opens their Bible and says, man, I just cannot wait to read Leviticus? <laughs> Leviticus is, uh, it, it takes place in the second year in the wilderness, and, and it's a book of laws. I mean, there's some narrative in it, but 90% of it is law after law after law, all these laws that, they're, that the people of Israel need to follow. And it's named after uh, the son of Israel, Levi, because the, the tribe of Levi were those who were in charge of the law. They were the ones who were in charge to make sure that the people were keeping the law. And so that's why the book is called Leviticus. The book of Numbers, which we're reading from today, actually contains 38 years of wandering in the wilderness. And, and is basically a highlight reel of the whole trip, right? It's, uh, it's not every single detail, but it's a, it's a highlight reel of the real trip. And then finally, we have the book of Deuteronomy, which is a, a speech from Moses where he, uh, they're sitting on the doorstep of the promised land. And before they go into the promised land, Moses is, is telling them the whole story from how they got from Egypt to where they are. And uh, that, the, that when they go in the promised land, right, uh, uh, this time, don't mess up, right? Because uh, they went into the promised land once before with some spies and then ran away and ended up wandering in the wilderness. So it's Moses recapping, hey, this is what it took to get us here. Now don't mess up. Go in and take the promised land. Well, our story happens well into the Exodus. And uh, this time in Exodus um, was not by, done by accident. Many people either forget or don't realize that the people of Israel made it to the promised land in the first year of the Exodus. In one year, they made it to the promised land, actually less than a year. And it would have taken a whole lot less time than that, but they had to stop at Mount Sinai and, and, and do all that stuff, right? So they got to the promised land, and they, and they sent spies into the, uh, the promised land. This is found in Numbers 13. And they saw these big, scary people and said, no, we don't want to go in there. And so God honored it and, and told them, okay, then you can wander in the wilderness and time out for 40 years. They didn't trust God, and now we find them wandering when they could have been sitting on the beach with umbrella drinks and stuff like that, right? But instead, they're wandering in this wilderness, and they, they eat the same meal every day, 
They, uh, uh, they are attacked by people after people after people, most of the time by this uh, group of people called the Canaanites. And this brings us up to our scripture today. In this narrative, we find that the people of Israel have been wandering in the wilderness and it is now the 39th year of that wandering. And yet again, they have been attacked by the Canaanites at Mount, at Mount Hor, which is where our scripture began, that they were leaving Mount Hor. And some of their people were captured, but the scripture reads that the Canaanites were handed over to them, that they prayed to God and God handed over the Canaanites. In other words, they defeated this, this massive army, right? These nomadic people who were born slaves were able to defeat an army that they were outnumbered by. Had to be a miracle from God, right? Right? And they've seen these miracles their whole time in the wilderness. So they are leaving Mount Hor, and they head into the plains of the, of the Negev Desert. That's a, that's a cool name for a desert, right? Negev. And the Negev is, a, is a, like if you look at where modern-day Israel is now, and you trace it along the Sinai Peninsula, it's that desert right there. And they head into this, this big plain of the Negev Desert, and, uh, they're liter- and they're, they're literally making their last trip to come back around, around the, uh, this mountain to, uh, to enter the promised land. And what do they do? They've been wandering for 39 years. And God has just saved them from this massive army. And they're heading to the promised land. They're almost there. And what do they do? They start complaining. Because why not, Right? And they say, uh, Scripture reads that they spoke against God and against Moses and said, Why have you brought us out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? There's no bread, there's no water, and we detest this miserable food, that that manna that God had provided for them. I mean, they'd been eating it for 39 years. I mean, I get it, right? Like, I love steak. Steak's like one of my favorite foods, right? In fact, I don't think you're allowed to live in Texas unless you love steak, right? <laughs> but if that was all I had to eat every day, it wouldn't take me long to be tired of steak, right? So I, I, I get it. They, they were probably really tired of manna. But the issue is just they're forgetting what God has done for them. They... They were praying for God to save them in Egypt, and he did. They, they were upset when there was no food in the wilderness because they were in the middle of a desert, and, and they were used to, uh, to uh, growing their food, right? And so God gave them manna. He gave them food that was not going to be the whole time. It was until they messed all that up, right? And they were given the opportunity to go into the promised land, and they were scared. And so God honored their wishes. You don't want to go in? Fine. Don't. I'll keep you out for 40 years. And they prayed for God just recently to deliver them from this massive enemy, and he does. And what do they do? What does God get for all of this trouble? Does he get a thank you, God? They curse him. And if you remember from last week, cursing God is is a sin called blasphemy, right? It is a sin. And what, what is the penalty for sin? Death. And they entered into this covenant with God, and now they're breaking that covenant again. Over and over and over, they keep breaking this covenant so God keeps his word, and, and he allows these venomous snakes to enter into the camp, and, and, and people start getting bit by them, and they begin to die slowly. It didn't take them long to realize that God was using these snakes to punish them, to, to get their attention. You know, when bad things happen in others' lives, I, I'm often asked why God would allow that. Why would God allow bad things to happen? And, and, you know, I'm not God, and so I can't speak for God. But I think every situation is different. Um, sometimes I feel that it's just a, a, we're a part of a broken world, a, a world that 
that is broken because of the sin that, that exists in this world, because we sin. And, uh, and as we talked about last week, no one is perfect and we are all, we are all to blame. And so we all contribute to the, the state of this world. But on the other hand, I believe that there are some times that, that God will use that uncomfortableness to, to grab our attention, to, to guide us back where, where God wants us to go. Because God does have a plan for us, and we're not usually good at following that plan, are we? So sometimes when, when God really desires us to go, to, uh, go a certain way, I think he'll make our lives very uncomfortable so that we follow his will. In the incident that we're talking about here, I, I, I really think it's that ladder right there. That God is, I mean, he's almost got them back to the promised land. And they're, they're doing it again. And he needs them to realize what they're doing. So he's using this to guide them back on that right path. So the people of Israel, they, they, they recognize what's happening and they pray and they ask forgiveness and, and, for, uh, uh, and God tells Moses that, uh, to fashion this snake and he, and he fashions it out of, out of bronze and to put it on a pole and he lifts up this snake and, and he says that anyone who repents and looks upon this snake will be healed, right? In other words, they'll be forgiven, because their sin is what brought the snakes, right? And the bite from the snakes that was killing them, that was the punishment for their sin. And the healing was that the venom was the venom that, the, uh, the, uh, that it had been forgiven. That they had been forgiven. Again. And again. And again. So why am I talking about this ancient story of Moses during the season of Lent? Well, it's because this story, it, it foreshadows the way God will save all of us. Even Jesus mentions this story. If we jump forward to John's gospel in chapter 3, we, we have this, this beautiful account of this, this Pharisee named Nicodemus. Uh, I don't know if you remember that story, but, but Nicodemus had, had come to visit Jesus at night because, uh, because he was scared to let other people see him visiting. He saw Jesus and he saw the miracles that he was doing. And he realized that, that there's something special about Jesus. I mean, he had seen prophets come and, and, uh, uh, and do, uh, do different things. And most of them false prophets. And he expected Jesus to be just another one of those uh, tide of people that come and try to get glory. But he's now seeing Jesus, and he's recognizing that there's something different about Jesus. So he goes and visits Jesus by night, and they have this conversation. And, and Jesus says that, it, that if you want to gain eternal life, you need to be born again. That uh, you need to be made new. And, of course, he's like, how, how can that be? And then, and then Jesus says, what do you mean? You're a Pharisee. You're the teacher of the scriptures. You're a great teacher in these people. You have spent your life studying these books. How do you not know? How do you not know? And then uh, Jesus points out, points out that, that everything that he needed to know about how to, to gain righteousness, to be saved, is found right there in the, in the scriptures and especially in the Torah. And Jesus says in verse 14 and 15 of that, he says, just as, ju just as Moses lifted up a snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. That the snake would become a man. And that man was he. When the people of Israel looked upon that, that wooden pole erecting that snake above them, and they looked, uh, looked upon it with a heart of repentance, they were saved from the sins that they committed on that plane. They were saved from the snakes and the punishment of their sin. When we look at that wooden cross that Jesus was lifted up, 
with a heart of repentance, we too become saved. But the salvation we receive is not from venomous snakes. It's from the venom of our sin. It's from that darkness that we allow inside of us that separates us from God. The story of Torah, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy is a story of people not trusting God. All the way with all the way back with Adam and Eve, they didn't trust God. And it's a story of God still loving them. It's a story of God gifting them with blessings while they are cursing him. It's a story of redemption. How can we learn from this story? Well, what are we cursing God for? Is there something in your life that you wish was different? There's something in your life that you don't trust God enough with? Maybe there's a promised land that he's got set for you. Maybe it's a career. Maybe it's a life change. And he just wants you to go that direction. And instead, you go your own way. What has God given us that we should be grateful about? You know, sometimes we get so focused on what we don't have that we forget what God has given us. People of Israel were sure they, they were not happy that there was no bread and water, but they had manna. God had given them food to live. So what do we need to repent of? This is what the season of Lent is all about. That as we progressively get closer to Easter, we are progressively getting closer to the cross. We are getting closer to his salvation again because we continue to walk away from God. And yet God continues to redeem us. So as we prepare to pray, I, I'd like you to take a moment and close your eyes. I'd like you to visualize that cross at Calvary. Visualize Jesus hanging from that cross because of rusty nails forced through his skin. Picture the crown of thorns upon his head and the blood that is dripping down his forehead. And I want you to remember why he is there. What sin did you do that God did this for you? Let us pray. God, we pray for your salvation again. God, lift us up once more. Let us look upon your face and know that you are God. And though that you have the power to destroy, you just... You decide to redeem instead. That when we walk away from you, you continue to follow us, to chase us down, to lead us back into your arms. God, let us follow your ways. Forgive us, we pray. Amen.
shakes the whole earth with holy thunder and leaves us breathless in awe and wonder. The King of glory, the King above all kings. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would for me. Hear the good news. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. This is the word of our Lord, and this is our commission to you. Go forth and make disciples of all nations. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, go in peace. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love that you would take.